Welcome to St. John's Lutheran Church, Springfield, Ohio. Today is September 18th. This is Communion Sunday. St. John's is located at 27 North Wittenberg Avenue, Springfield, Ohio. Our telephone number is Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to our worship service this morning. You a special welcome to our visitors. If you're new in the spring in the Clark County area or looking for new church home, we invite you to St. John, your new church home. Since this is a celebration of the Lord's Supper, all of the liturgy is in your bulletin. The only need for the red hymnal or for the hymns and for our opening rite, the order of confession and forgiveness. Everything else is in your bulletin. So after we sing the opening, or after we do the confession and sing the opening hymn, then you go to page two in your bulletin and follow it uh, through the service. So I now invite those who can without difficulty to stand as we turn to page 94 and prepare our hearts and minds for worship with the order of the confession. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom our hearts are open, our desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Welcome to St. John's Lutheran Church. This is the very old hymn, Be Thou My Vision. We should concentrate on the words, the beautiful words. It's an Irish hymn, 8th century. Imagine how old. Imagine how long the Christians have been singing this. It was translated by Eleanor H. Hull from the 8th century Irish hymn, Be Thou My Vision, Lord of My Heart. Not all else to me, save thou art.
Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. September the 18th, 18th Sunday after Pentecost. The first reading is from Amos 8th chapter. Hear this, you that trample on the needy, and bring to room the poor of the land, saying, When will the new moon be over, so that we may sell grain, and the Sabbath, so that we may offer wheat for sale? We will make the epoch soft, small, and the shackle great, and practice deceit with false balances, buying the poor for silver and sandals, and selling the sweet meats of the wheat. The Lord has sworn by the pride of Jacob. Surely I will never forget any of their deeds. The word of the Lord. <coughs> Thanks be to God. God. Dege will do the song.
Timothy Singleton. We'll do the second reading. The second reading is from 1 Timothy chapter 2. First of all, then, I urge that supplications, prayers, interceptions, and thanksgivings be made for everyone, for kings and all who are in high positions, so that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and dignity. This is right and is acceptable in the sight of God our Savior who desires everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, there is also one mediator between God and humankind, Christ Jesus, himself human, who gave himself a ransom for all. This was attested at the right time. For this I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying. A preacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We're singing the gospel acclamation. This is Pastor John Pollock, our Pollock, is preparing. He's our pastor, Pastor Pollock, preparing to read the scripture, the Holy Gospel, Jesus' words. Special music by the Chancel Choir, led by Vicki Perks.
St. Paul is telling Timothy that if God, through faith in Jesus Christ, could save someone as wretched as him, a persecutor of the church, then why in the world would someone believe that he cannot, Jesus Christ, cannot save him? St. Paul also is urging prayer for authority, that we might lead a quiet and peaceful life in an ordered society in which we obey the laws of our society as long as they do not ask us to do something that conflicts with the word of God. In that fourth commandment of honor your father and mother, God sets up authority. And not only the authority of our parents over us, but the authority of government. And as St. Peter and St. Paul in their epistles, and as the Apostle and the Hebrews and St. James and St. John emphasized, in their epistles, authority is ordained by God. And government is set up by God as long as it is not in conflict with God's will. When St. Peter and St. John, in the fifth chapter of the book of Acts, are arrested for preaching Jesus Christ crucified and resurrected in the temple. And they're brought before the Sanhedrin. The chief priests demand that they no longer preach Jesus Christ in the temple or anywhere else in Jerusalem. Well, St. Peter responds by saying, quote, We must obey God rather than men. And that is our marching of orders as well. We are obedient to those in authority until they conflict with God's word. Until they ask us to do something that we know is contrary to God's will. This is why Dietrich Bonhoeffer could say that if government betrays the word of God and asks us to disobey it, then we can resist. And Dietrich Bonhoeffer carried this out with his own life. He was at his early 30s. He was already a famous Lutheran theologian and leader of the resistant church to the Nazification or the attempt of Nazification of Christianity. And he resisted it in his attempt to try to submit the church to Teutonic paganism and mythology. And because of Hitler's demand that the church kneel to him, Bonhoeffer said it was right to resist, and so he was involved in a plot to try to execute Hitler. Of course, it was discovered, unfortunately, and Bonhoeffer was arrested. And just a day or so before the U.S. Army liberated the Flossenburg concentration camp where he was being kept, he was hanged on a direct order of Adolf Hitler. That he listened to God instead of me. So we are to pray for those who are in authority so that they will not ask us to do that which is contrary to God's will. So that they will not ask us to violate our Christian faith in the Word of God, but instead live up to our Lord Jesus Christ's wishes and the wishes of our Heavenly Father and resist when necessary. In this portion of St. Paul's letter to Timothy, he is also reminding us that sometimes we as human beings are tempted to look at leaders as being a savior of the world or a savior for us instead of looking only to God and the Lord Jesus Christ. As St. Timothy says in verse 5, quote, for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man the man Christ Jesus. So only Christ is our Savior. Only Christ can save a person, a community, or a nation. Yet this has been a common tool of the dictator and the tyrant to try to present themselves as a Savior of that nation so that the people will flock to them and do whatever they desire. This, of course, is what Hitler did. Germany was beaten down after World War I, was suffering terribly with their economy. They uh, had been given uh, a heavy burden of reparations for World War I. The German people felt beaten down. They had the lowest self-esteem. They had lost their pride. So here comes Hitler talking about reestablishing Germany as the main country in Europe. Establishing a thousand year right, bringing back the German pride and German nationalism, being their savior economically, financially, politically, nationally, and even spiritually. 
spiritually. And unfortunately, the people of Germany forgot their Christian values and succumbed to the phony scene. And people still do it today. Phony leaders still try to be phony saviors. And we in America are not immune to such incidents ourselves, not by dictators or tyrants, but every four years we have a presidential election. Too often the heat of the election and the fanaticism of people supporting one candidate or another will push their candidates if they're the savior of America. Back when I was in seminary, 1976, Dr. George Farrell, some of you may recognize the names, others of you probably won't, but Dr. Farrell was the chairman of the Department of Religion down at the University of Iowa. He also was a Lutheran theologian and pastor. He had a national and international reputation for his theological works. We had come to Wittenberg to give a talk about faith in the modern day society, and he brought up the then ongoing presidential election, because it was in the fall of 76. The election, as some of you will remember, because you're as old as I am, the election between Jimmy Carter and then President Gerald Ford, who had become president when President Nixon had to resign. And so in that context, there was this kind of fanaticism on each side of presenting their presidential candidates as savior of America. And if he voted for the other guy, America was doomed, and so forth. And Dr. Ferrer reminded us in his speech that neither Jimmy Carter nor Gerald Ford were the savior of America. The savior of America was the person who in the first century AD had been nailed to a cross outside the walls of Jerusalem near a garbage dump and had paid the price for the salvation of the world. And that politicians would come and go, presidents would come and go, but Jesus Christ remains forever. And so we must not fall into the trap of making Jesus Christ a human savior looking at him strictly in political terms or economic terms or financial terms. That is not why Jesus Christ came into the world. He did not come to give us a playbook for one political party or another. He did not come into the world to give us a financial plan over another. He did not come to give us advice on our economic system. He came to save the world. He came so that God's most ignored wish might become true. The primary function of Jesus is for the salvation of human beings. This is why that night on the roof, when Nicodemus came to visit him in the cover of darkness, he said to Nicodemus those famous words known as the gospel in a nutshell, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And then in verse 17, for God sent his Son into the world, into the world not to condemn the world, not to be a policeman chasing you so he can arrest you. He sent him into the world not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. No politics, no finances, no economics, salvation. Salvation, so that you might have an eternal life in the kingdom of heaven where you won't have to worry about politics or finances or economics. That is why Jesus came to fulfill that desire of God our Heavenly Father. The invitation of Jesus is for everyone, no matter who they might be. He loves all people and he invites all people to salvation no matter who they are, where they are, or what time it is. Jesus will not turn anyone away. If you come to Jesus, he will accept you. If you come to Jesus, he will embrace you. Remember the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John. Jesus is talking to the crowds. And he says to them, Quote, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. End of quote. I will never cast anyone out who comes to me. You may move away from Jesus, but Jesus will never cast you out. It's like the old saying goes, if you feel like there is distance between you and God, make no mistake about who's moved. It's not God who's moved. It's you who moved away from God. But sometimes
towns, we had people who would not accept God's gracious invitation. I don't know if they think they know more than God, more than Jesus Christ or what, but they just will not accept that gift of salvation. But that's the only payment God will accept for the sins that we commit. As the old barbershop back home in Louisville said on its wall, it says, In God we trust, all others pay cash. No checks, no credit cards. Cash is the only payment. Jesus Christ is the only payment for the sins that you commit. Jesus Christ is the only payment for the sins of the world. Jesus Christ is the only one who can reestablish that relationship between us and God the Father, which is broken because of the sins that we commit. And so why would anyone refuse that gracious invitation? We don't have to do anything. We don't have to earn it by abiding by a bunch of laws and rules and regulations governing everything from how we dress to how we fix our foods to how many steps we walk on the Lord's day to how we greet people to how we interact with people. None of that is required. It's only that you believe that Jesus Christ suffered and died on that cross, that first good trial, to pay the debt of sin that you owe, so that instead of being an outcast and separated from God, you can be a child of God, a brother and sister to Jesus Christ. And all of creation, only we humans are made in the image and likeness of God with a moral sense and moral awareness. Our animal friends have no such awareness, no such moral compass. They simply act from instinct and experience. And we're not animals. We are the creation of a Heavenly Father who made us <laughs> in His image and likeness and breathed into us the Yet ever since Adam and Eve chose to disobey God and His Word, we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So we all need a Savior. And God's wish is that we come to salvation through His Son, Jesus Christ. Because of His great love for us, God wills that we all be saved just like He desired Saul, the persecutor of the church, would be saved and become Paul, the apostle and missionary. There will be those, unfortunately, who will reject that gracious invitation. But for those of us who accept that invitation, for those of us who gather at the foot of the cross, for those of us who cling to the cross, for those of us who know that because Jesus suffered and died and rose again, and we can face tomorrow. Why doesn't Jesus return? Why doesn't he return now and end all the pain and horror in the world? Well, St. Peter answers that question for us in his second letter. When he says in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, quote, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance in the world. Not wishing that any should perish, but that all have the opportunity to repent and be saved. So when Jesus Christ is chasing you, he's not chasing you to punish you. He's chasing you so that you do not take of the poison of the world and of the devil, but instead come to him and have salvation. This is why St. Paul in our reading this morning is so earnestly praying and telling St. Timothy in the church to pray and petition God on behalf of all people because the power of prayer can be very effective. St. Augustine or Augustine Whichever you prefer. Probably the second greatest theologian of the church and had the second most influence on the theology of the church to, next to St. Paul. Did not grow up a Christian. His 
mother was a Christian, a devout Christian. But he and his father remained in the pagan Roman religion of their day. And St. Augustine became a professor of basically what we would say today was speech and communication, not in the call of rhetoric. And he had a pretty good reputation as a professor of rhetoric, but he also was what we could refer to as a hedonist or a follower of the Playboy philosophy. He enjoyed satisfying the desires of the flesh, but his mother continued to pray earnestly for his salvation and for that of his father. Sure enough, one day, those prayers were answered. The father became a Christian, and St. Augustine became a Christian through the preaching and the guidance and the memory of St. Ambrose, who was bishop of Milan at the time. So this is why we are asked to pray earnestly for those who have yet answered the call to salvation by grace and faith. So the power of the Holy Spirit may enter their lives, calling them to the gospel and bringing them to salvation. So do not reject God's often ignored mission desire. But instead, accept his gift of salvation. Accept that Jesus Christ is the only and true Savior of the world. And pray for the salvation of others as well. Amen. Peace of God which passes all understanding through your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen.
Jesus Christ. Amen. It's time for our offering. Bill and Mary Nevis are our ushers for today. Harvey Baker, worship assistant. See the acolytes bringing forward the offering plates. Connie Singleton has been our reader. We announced that there's a birthday celebration for Bill Stump. Bill thought it was this Sunday, but it's next Sunday, September the 24th, 2 to 4 p.m., St. John's Lutheran Church. Bill will celebrate his 90th birthday. Come for cake and ice cream, uh, and just bring warm wishes, no gifts. Bill is now in Oakwood. He fell. He's getting better. Very devout church member, Bill Stump. Please come for his birthday party. We have today Holy Communion. We receive God's blessing. We, God does not desire that any be saved. And we are saved by receiving the body and blood of Jesus Christ. We have eternal life, a great gift. All we have to do is believe. Repent, love God, love others, and believe. Our closing hymn will be the Church of Christ in every age. That will be after O Lamb of God. The flowers on the chancel stands today are presented by Pam Riggs in loving memory of her mother, Georgia Kramer. Also by Nelson Klopfenstein in loving memory of the anniversary of the death of Virginia Sharp on September the 18th. These are the flowers that are in the front, live flowers, beautiful flowers that will be taken to the shut-ins at uh, Masonic Home, Oakwood, uh, at um, Forest Land, places where we have shut-ins. Somebody will be receiving flowers today. They'll be divided up and they'll give out as many flowers as they can. They're given by Pam Riggs and Nelson Popfenstein, live flowers. You see the acolytes as they're receiving communion. This is the 18th of September, the 18th Sunday after Pentecost. Come, repent, believe, love God, love your neighbor, love others. Accept Jesus Christ, believe in him, and receive eternal life. We now receive his true body and blood, and he will be with us forever. He has died so that he could be with us, remain with us as a part of us as we receive his body and blood. He has done this for us, wonderful gift. He came in a gift of love, he came to bring love into the world, not hatred. We want to make America love one another and be loving again. We don't want hatred.
gave thanks and gave it for all the drinks sent. This cup is a new covenant my blood shed for you for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. For as often as we eat of this bread and drink from this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Christ, Christ is died. Christ, Christ is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will come again. again. Remembering that for his sanitary command, his life to be passion and death, his glorious resurrection and ascension, and the promise of his coming again, we give you thanks to you, O Lord God Almighty, not as we ought, but as we are able. We ask you mercifully to accept our praise and thanksgiving, and with your word and Holy Spirit to bless us, your servants, in these your own gifts of bread and wine, so that we and all who share in the body and blood of Christ may be filled with heavenly blessing and grace, and receiving the forgiveness of sin, and be formed to live as your holy people, and be given our inheritance with all your sins. To you, O God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the all honor and glory of your holy church, now and forever. Amen. Gather in the one God, Holy Spirit, let us praise Jesus for us. Our, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom, kingdom come, thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever.
We believe in the real presence of Jesus Christ in his body and his blood as he has proclaimed that this is his body, this is his blood. And in John, John has written that this will give us eternal life. We we're taking communion, we we're receiving Jesus Christ with all the people who have gone before us, with our angels and archangels. This is a wonderful blessing, a wonderful mystery. It will help us to live a loving life, to love God and love others, and to have eternal life. See God's face, to be with Jesus, to be with those who are love, who love us in heaven forever. Church of Christ in Every Age it was written by Fred Pratt Green, who lived 1903 to 2000. A beautiful hymn, The Church of Christ in Every Age, he said by change, but spirit led. Pastor Sermon said, God desires for all to be saved. We've taken Holy Communion and now received the body and blood of Jesus Christ. Sing the song, Church of Christ in Every Age.
Sunday after Pentecost, St. John's Church. Thank you for watching us on YouTube. Tune in anytime. We're happy to bring you this service. Our church offers a Christian school program, although it's not up and running now. We hope to get our school and daycare running by January. We're looking for an administrator. And we're looking to the board because the school to help us. We've been in a school for 60 years, and we hope to continue. If you're interested in our school, call 325-4311. 325-4311. Call the church office. And then call the old school office. And we'll try to get our school going again. I hope and pray that you will worship with us in person. Worship with us on YouTube. Come help us feed the poor and feed 8,000 families a month. So please come and help us feed the poor. We have an outreach closet. We have a service. On Wednesday night, which you can receive Holy Communion, the Body and Blood of Christ, every single week. And then the first Sunday and the third Sunday every month at the church, the Body and Blood of Jesus Christ, you can receive. He'll be with you forever. He died so He could come back and save us and be with us. I hope and pray that God will continue to bless and keep you to stay in all your days. We'll pray for you, continue to pray for us in our YouTube ministry. Dr. Sally has a church. Announcer Linda Fox is the videographer, James Bond Pusher, Karen Dietrich, all helps with the service.